Welcome to the Society of Emergency Medicine Research Learning Series. I'm Dr. Lynn Rapolo, and I am delighted to be hosting today's session on randomization and RCTs. So there's so much to be said about this topic. So we're going to be having a focused, interactive discussion with two very experienced researchers who we are delighted to have here. And then we'll just kind of focus on some helpful information, pearls, and pitfalls on this topic for novice researchers or anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about research, especially biostat. So before we begin, I just want to introduce our esteemed guest. First, we have Dr. Robert Ehrman. He is an associate professor of emergency medicine at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. He completed his emergency medicine residency at Yale New Haven Hospital and a fellowship in emergency ultrasound at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. In 2019, he received his Master's of Science in Biostats and Research Design from the University of Michigan. He is the Director of Emergency Ultrasound Research at Detroit Medical Center, a member of the Biostats Epidemiology and Research Design Group at Wayne State University, and a methods and statistics editor for academic emergency medicine. His research focuses on the use of heart and lung ultrasound in combination with biomarkers to optimize fluid resuscitation in sepsis. He is the PI and has received research funding from NIGMS, SAEMF, and multiple industry contracts. He has collaborated on multiple studies involving echocardiography and lung ultrasound and acute heart failure with funding from HLBI and IMD, NIMHD and EMF. So um, a lot of acronyms and some of, I'm not sure, but they're just um, very amazing, impressive accomplishments. So um, welcome, Dr. Ehrman. We're very happy to have you here. And we have Dr. Christine Ramden. She is a faculty member at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School Department of Emergency Medicine. She has a PhD in biomedical informatics, and her research interests are in addiction medicine, medical toxicology, pain medicine, and stroke. She has published several studies using big data sources, such as NHHCUP and NSSATS, and has worked with the NSDUH and TDS data set, along with several other local and national data sets, and has experience in conducting big data analysis and utilizing several different types of statistical methods. So I have seen both of their work, and so I'm absolutely thrilled that they are here to join us today. So thank you for um, both being here. This session is not just on RCTs. This series is actually on biosets. We're doing several of these at least every month. And so we wanted to talk about how we can improve some other kind of studies that we frequently do, especially early in our research career. So I just wanted to kind of take a moment and talk about observational studies, because this is one that we most commonly do. And Several of studies that I've read lately, especially in education and ultrasound, I just had questions for you on how we can make them better. So we know we do randomization to minimize bias. And I have been involved in a couple of studies and was talking to some of my colleagues and some other people through different sources. And I would love for you to kind of talk about what your opinion is evaluating some subsets of a total data sample to determine inter-rater reliability and using randomization to improve that. Because we'll read some studies, like an ultrasound study, and I know, Dr. Ehrman, you're an ultrasound person. They have a data collection of the educational study, and then they'll say, we have two experts and ultrasound review it. If we disagree, we'll have a third person review it. And so basically, it's just saying that two people agree and one doesn't. And so I wanted to kind of talk to you about if there was a way, and I was kind of doing this in my own research, and I wanted to take 10% of your total sample, and maybe we can create a subset of that and randomize your subject's data so you can pick 10% of that database. So you're not like taking the time to review 600 scans and then somehow having a way to have your reviewers review this 10% of the scans and determine their iterator reliability so that maybe for the rest of the scans, you don't need to have more than one person review them. And I just wanted your opinion on that. And if you agree with it, or maybe there's another way, if you do agree with it, you propose how somebody would approach that. So Christy, maybe if you don't mind starting and then we'll have Rob and then, you know, we'll kind of switch places for some other questions. I know that was a loaded question, but I, hopefully I, I said it pretty clear to your understanding. 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that important question. So, you know, as we all know, there's several different measures of consistency. And I just want to give you guys a little bit of background and then tell you my approach for calculating these quote unquote sample sizes for determining reliability. So there's this kappa that we're all aware of. It's called Cohen's kappa. And that's generally used. And um, the criteria for using it is that you have to have two sets of data points. It's, the, it's evaluating reliability for exactly two raters. And your outcome that you're measuring has to be in the form of a binary variable, like yes or no, or true and false, right? And if you think of this conceptually, like if you have 10 data points, it's a calculation you can simply do on paper. If you're looking at something and the first grader rated at one, and the second rater um, rated at zero, their agreement is zero for that particular data point, right? Because one of them said it was one and the other one said it was zero. And then you go down your list of agreements or disagreements. They both might agree on the second question. They rated it one. Therefore, you rate their agreement as one. You get down to the bottom of your list of your 10, and then you calculate the proportion that they agreed on. That proportion is your inter-rater reliability. That's what you call Cohen's kappa. It could be done simply as that. Now, when you're in the unique situation where you have more than two raters, you use another kappa called Fleiss's kappa. And that kappa is specifically used when you have, again, more than two raters. So you have your set of data points for three different people. So you're looking at three columns of data now, which is not simply, you know, yes, no, whether they agree or not. It, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And you would use your statistical software, whether it's SPSS, or online, whatnot. And they would give you your inter-rater reliability, which is called Fleiss's kappa. There's also different types of measures of consistency depending on your outcome variable, right? So in these cases, our outcome variables were nominal or categorical. There's also intra-class correlation, which can be used for when you have data clusters or different types of data. Like when you have your x-axis and your y-axis and measuring two different things, you use intra-class correlation. An example of that is convex alpha, which is a special case of intra-class correlation and which many of you ha may have seen in the ultrasound literature or medical education literature. It's typically used to measure reliability on scale data or test data. And so in terms of calculating the sample size, a lot of things I actually look at the medical literature and being a biostatistician and all, I rely a lot on formulas. And actually, believe it or not, a lot of times I see in the medical literature, there's not like actually a formal sample size calculation you'd put it for this inter-rater reliability for the number you need to get for the sample in order to get desired inter-rater reliability. But these formulas actually do exist. And they're probably too much to discuss on this call, but I just want to let everyone know that they do exist. And for some of my studies that I've done and I've used inter-rater reliability for, I've actually referred to these articles on how to calculate the sample size needed to get my desired inter-rater reliability. The other piece to it I wanted to add is sometimes you have to use your discretion. So recently we published an article where we had um, multiple raters look at pain services given on web described on websites for substance use treatment centers. And so we first started, I'm like, hey, we had four raters. You guys go. These are the 10 websites. Each of you evaluate whatever criteria we had, and we'll bring it back together, and then I'll do the calculation. And after I did that calculation, I noticed that the reliability wasn't that good. And we actually found that we had to do several iterations, probably up to uh, 40 websites, like four times in order to achieve that desired data reliability number. So my comment is here, just don't limit yourself to a sample size or a 10% subset or whatever. I think you have to do what's best for your study and your study team. Like if you find that you're not happy with an interrelated reliability of 0.6, you just have to keep on modifying your study procedures, making it more clear and more well-defined for your study and your study team so that you can optimize your inter-rater reliability, which I think is the goal to come out with a really good study at the end. So that's really what I have to say about that. If you get an inter-rater reliability of 0.6, it just seems really low. So would you go back and redo how people are grading? Because clearly there's a big difference. So and let me just ask, I wanted to ask Rob, because I know you review a lot of the ultrasound literature and you're familiar with how some of these studies because you're reviewing scans and you have people that score 
a bunch of different ultrasounds. And I'm an ultrasound person, so I'm just going to use that as an example. But you can use this for any educational study. They're studying curriculums and they're, they're, you have a reviewer that's grading some uh, NS data, standard um, direct observational tool or that kind of thing. So what I wanted to know, just because you have people reviewing these, you know, sometimes they'll have one person reviewing all these different people, and then they'll have another person reviewing all these different people. And I just wanted your opinion on how to most scientifically do it, you know, so you can also like report it and it looks legitimate instead of just kind of thrown together haphazardly. Like, you know, if you could take a suit, because planning and, and research, I think, you know, as you know, is really, really important. So if we kind of know the background of how you do it and kind of how to approach it, then you're more likely to get your paper published, I would think. So yeah. what are your thoughts, Rob? Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. It's a great kind of explanation, Christine. It's hard, like a lot of things with statistics, people want there to be like, quote, an answer or think there is like an answer. And there's oftentimes there's a lot of matter of opinion or it depends. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've done some stuff working with iterative or agreement or for example, we did like a study looking at like beelines and heart failure and comparing, like we trained research text to do it and then compared, then had an expert overread. But it's a great question because it's like, do you need two raters to review everything? And this is where it comes back to my, it depends. Some of it is feasibility in the perfect world you would have two raters do every scan and then look at their agreement. But if there's 1,500 lung ultrasound exams, you don't want to have two readers have to read all of them. There are formal ways you could do, like Christine was saying, you could do a sample size calculation and say, okay, I need an ICC of 0.75 to say that this is my goal ICC. Therefore, this is how many scans both have to read to detect that with whatever level of significance you see. More often than not, and this happens in ultrasound literature, other stuff too, but it kind of more comes down to feasibility where you say, okay, we're going to have two reviewers look at 200. We're going to have one reviewer review scans. And ultimately you, you, you pick some arbitrary number, 10% are going to be reviewed by both. You see this in meta analyses too, where it's like, oh, Two people independently reviewed the abstracts, and then the third made the decision by consensus. I mean, all this stuff is essentially arbitrary, uh, you know, and so there's no, quote, right answer. And like I said, oftentimes it comes down to feasibility where it's like, okay, you know, 25% is too much and 5% is not enough. It depends a little. Obviously, more is better, but most of this, this stuff I've seen and I've even proposed like in a grant application is like we're going to independently review 15% of charts to confirm that this is like the actual diagnosis that like code spit out. So, you know, again, that not to be, you know, vague or unscientific, but a lot of this stuff you know, doesn't have a, like an exact rule. Sure. Yes, it's, I, it's... I hear what you're saying. And it, it, you see, I mean, we're reading those articles, so they're getting published, even though they're not very scientific, but just given how it's getting more difficult to get things published, I was just hoping that we can help people maybe make their data collection and their methodology more scientific so that it is more attractive you know, to reviewers and gets published. So you mentioned 0 0.7. Mm -hmm. Is that good enough? What's like- I don't know. I just, I, I made that up. I can't remember what number we actually used in the study. It, it depends on what your data are, like the difference between like 17 and 18 or 17 and 15 really significantly not sure. if you're talking about something that identifies aortic dissection like two or three percent error that's you know would be an unacceptable miss rate or whatever you kind of uh, get the point well to answer your question then i'd like to hear what christine thinks because she's has a good perspective or different perspective from mine mm -hmm. a lot of it is about just sort of explaining why you did what you did certainly i think if the primary outcome of your study is a compare is like an inter-rate reliability then you should do a sample size calculation if it's not the, the primary outcome where you're going to look at an ultrasound thing, you're going to look at like a thousand scans and it's just not feasible to look at, to have two people review a thousand scans and just saying like, we're going to review a representative sample of 15%. As long as you're, personally, I would rather, I give more stock to something, a, a paper I'm reviewing when they're straightforward about feasibility reasons. This is the, the choice we made versus trying to make it seem more scientific than it actually is. But that's actually a really good point, mentioning all of these things in your limitations. We're doing a lung ultrasound study. We have like several hundred, 600 scans. And so we took a small subset and I did not like our CAPA. We had all of our reviewers, four people review them and CAPA 0.6. So we redid our whole rubric. So I'm just crossing my fingers. It's higher. So I was just curious, you know, and I know a lot of people are in the same boat doing these kind of studies. Like what is the number that would be feasible? But it sounds like it depends 0.75 is not bad. And as long as you report your limitations, that I think you get points for that, if you will, with the reviewers. Were you going to say something, Christine? 
Yes, absolutely. And I completely second Dr. Ermin here. Like, it really depends on the clinical question you're asking, how good you want that reliability to be, right? Like, in certain scenarios, my substance use pain center treatment study, for example, I don't think it probably was really important to get that integrated reliability to one, but that doesn't mean we're not going to try to get better than that. So just being real about your expectations and how important the question is. And the other piece is also to remember, what are you learning from going through each round of this inter-rater reliability with your team, right? Try to figure out why everyone's not agreeing on this and what can be done to improve their interpretation. Because clearly, if there's something that keeps on stopping them from agreeing on something, there must be something wrong with your question that you're asking to them or the way that you're designing your study. So I think just revisiting all these reasons helps you in the end to design a better study. So while it's not necessary to reach that one every time, just seeing why you're not reaching that one and what can you do better to reach that one and just kind of take it from there. That's a good point. I'm starting to wonder if maybe we do need AI to look at those B lines because we just can't seem to agree, but that's another talk. I'm sorry, what were you going to say, Rob? No, no, I was just going to say an underlying statistical concept to think about is I think you said you were talking about, Christine was talking about different kappas, so two raters and then more than two raters. And I think you said maybe you had four raters. It's just something to start to think about is like, as you increase the number of raters, you increase the needed sample size to detect a meaningful difference. Or another way to think about that would be the more raters you have, the more variance there's going to be between raters. And that Good makes point. your your study estimate essentially less precise, small levels of disagreement. Um, or if you think about it as an N by K table, if you have some cells that have small values in them, those are going to disproportionately affect your overall agreement. Having more raters in some ways is great because it could increase generalizability, but there's also the back end sort of nuts and bolts side of it, where it's actually harder to get good Kappa, like good agreement, the more raters you have just by the nature of within or between rater variables. That's such a good point. And that's exactly what I did. I shot myself in the foot because we did a study, I don't know, last year where we had a rubric for another ultrasound study and we just took 10% of all the scans and only had two people review them. And our Kappa was great. And then the rest of us kind of said, okay, this instrument is evaluating what we wanted it to. And then we had a bunch of other people scoring using that rubric, but we weren't evaluated in the study. And, and that was a limitation, but it was easier only having two people that were doing the inner rater reliability who did it completely independently. And it was just a small subset. So everybody didn't have to review all these scans. That's just impossible. Yeah. But that just makes it. Can I just, and the other thing I just wanted, cause you, there's some statistical terms regarding this that are thrown around it. I think People think that they're the same when we talk about inter-rater reliability and then inter-class coefficient. And um, if you wouldn't mind just clarifying, because it sounds like they're similar, but they're definitely not the same. And they're based on different kinds of data. And I think you had might have mentioned it, Christine, about the IRR versus the ICC and what kind of data, just so we can clarify that for people listening, because I think we hear about that a lot. Yeah. So, you know, they're all measures of consistency, right? And one thing I do want to mention, so you have to think of it like going back to your very, very basic statistics. There's different types of variables, right? There's categorical variables, there's continuous variables, there's ordinal variables. And so for, depending on what you're measuring, your measure outcome is, your type of in, we'll go probably into this later if our time allows it, your statistical test depends on the type of variables you have, right? So based on the type of your variable you have, your interpretation ends up changing. So for nominal variables, that's like our, you know, our yes, no type variables, our true false type variables, those are nominal variables. So we would use like our Cohen's kappa or the two, rater two plus rater extension, which is the Fleiss's kappa, right? If we have ordinal variables, like our outcome measure would be something called Kendall's tau, for example, for two raters. And then if like we have continuous variables or more than one variable type, the measurements is called of consistency. It's called inter-class correlation. And then you probably see, and as I was saying this before, there's this very specific type of inter-class correlation you probably see a lot. It's called convex alpha, and that's usually used to measure consistency within tests. When you have multiple questions, like if you're looking at an anxiety scale or a depression scale, and there's like several items, and you want to see if I have two raters rating the same patient using the same scale, how often are those two raters agreeing? That gives a measure of how 
good of your scale is of um, you know capturing the data you need. Otherwise, you probably need to modify your scale. So, like at the baseline, at the at the very uh, basic, it comes down to these different types of names for these different types of tests all come from the fact that there's different types of outcome variables that they end up measuring. So that's really what it is at the crux of the matter. Okay, that makes sense. That That's really helpful. Now I just want to kind of switch to actually randomize controlled trials and just some of the biostats involved. One, one last thing before you change topics okay. would just be the, you often see like percent agreement reported, right? So the, the problem with that is like, there's going to be some percent agreement based on chance. So Kappa is... How often do the lay explanations, how often do two readers agree like above what you'd expect by chance? Because there's always going to be some, you know, especially if there's only two outcomes, there's going to be some just by chance. So that's what Kappa takes that into account. So Kappa is always better. Well, always, I am generally better than uh, percent agreement. And then just since you do bring that up, do you have to report that? Do you typically report that? Not just because you see like a Kappa value, but some people say that you should actually report these numbers, like how often they agree. And just so people could actually see instead of just giving Kappa. I kind of like seeing the two by two table, but I, you know, I think if you ask five people, they'll give you three and a half different <laughs> answers. I, it, would, it would depend if it's like the major, you know, again, if it's like the primary outcome, I would want to see the actual raw data. If, if it's like, you know, some sensitivity analysis or something like that, it would be less important. Awesome. Thank you. So we're just going to switch gears and talk about bread and butter biostats for RCTs and want to bring it back to what you were discussing about sample size, but just taking a deeper dive. And so just as many of you know, or may not know, but there's reporting guidelines that you really should look at if you are doing research and look at it very early on while you're planning your research. And most of your research should be really like planning. And when you're actually doing the research, your collection should be just kind of filling in these blanks. And so there's some things that they are definitely required if you're doing an RCT and using the consort guidelines, reporting guidelines for RCTs. I just want to go through a few things because of course this is a limited amount of time. We probably have like 30 more minutes and we can talk about this forever and, and do a whole series on this. But if we can just talk about sample size calculation because I hear you don't have to report it, but it's probably better if you do. It gives your study more power, especially if you, you, know, you get that sample size. Like how do you get there? What is if you can talk about the effect size, power, and just kind of how someone would go about doing this and what they need to know. Is this something you always need to have a statistician or some software that you can calculate your sample size? I always use a statistician because I just don't have that brain, but there's a lot of people that are smarter than me and, and maybe they would just want to know. And I just want your opinion on that. So who wants to go first? Do you want to talk about this? Maybe Christine, you probably get this a lot. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. No, I'm totally fine with that. So again, the sample size calculations, right? There are several different formulas to calculate sample size. And all these different formulas, they come essentially from, again, the type of primary outcome, primary variable you're trying to calculate, right? So if your primary outcome is a proportion, like if you want to look at the proportion of people that are eating pizza in a specific population or like pizza, you start doing this, right? You go, um, as everyone says, you go back into the literature, you see what has already been published on this topic. And you kind of get an idea like, okay, there's been a study already published on this. They said that, you know, 50% of Asians or whatever race, African-Americans, Caucasians, 50% like pizza. That's what our study found. It was a descriptive study and that's what we found. And if you want to repeat that same study, just a larger study, you're going to use that proportion to calculate your sample size for your study if that's your primary outcome. So in this case, your primary outcome was a proportion. There might be another scenario where your outcome is a continuous variable, such as age, height, weight. In that case, there's a different formula for calculating that. There's also a different formula for calculating if you have a descriptive study or you're doing randomized control trial where you're trying to compare two groups. And these sample size calculations are not that difficult. The pieces of data you need primarily come from the previous studies, right? So whether it's that proportion, the calculation also needs like the variance or the standard deviation, depending on your outcome variable and the question you're asking. And they have standardized pre-computed values for your 95% confidence, which is well, like 1.96, like your Z-score that goes into the calculation and the percent error you want to allow. So if you want to allow 5% error only into your study, that's the number you put into the power calculation or 
whatever calculation it may be, that calculation admits your sample size. Now, that's if you want to manually calculate it. There's so many different formulas depending on your outcome variable. There's also several like SPSS. They have a tool to compute your sample size depending on whatever inputs you give it. Remember, those inputs come from previous literature. If no studies published on your topic, usually not necessary to do a sample size calculation. You simply state that there have been no studies of this, and therefore we're going to recruit 200 patients. Call this a pilot study. Otherwise, the data, like your mean, your variance, or whatever input data you need to input into that power calculation, it comes from previous studies that have already been conducted. Review the literature, find out what's previously been published, see what that effect size is. But if there hasn't been previous studies, do a pilot and figure out what the difference is that you might want to go for, or just don't do a sample size calculation. Rob, what are your thoughts on sample size calculations? Because I, I know you mentor a lot of emergency physicians. I mean, you, you both do. What are your thoughts of some of the key components? The answer to one of your questions is they're important and you should do them in most cases if you can. O overall, the idea is that you, ne you need some effect size and then some idea of the variability. Like if you're trying to look at blood pressure lowering, comparing average blood pressure in group A versus group B in an intervention. So your effect size would be how much you think your medication is going to reduce blood pressure. And then you need some measure of variability, right? If all if blood pressures are in like a tight range within, you know, five points, then there's less variability. It allows you to get smaller sample sizes. But if your blood pressures are all over, that's like a big thing. And, you know, the reason this is important and why I mention that is that Yes, they're important. I think you should almost always try to do them like so many other things. They oftentimes, at least in grant applications, are like a mixture between utility and feasibility. So a lot of times it's like, okay, I need to, you know, I know I have two years. And so you kind of know how much money you have and how many patients you can feasibly recruit and then trying to come up with a, a sample size calculation that is workable within the confines of your project. Sometimes it's as simple as looking at a proportion difference or a mean difference in some lab variable. If, if money were no option, you could do a robust sample size calculation. And there are ways to do more complicated sample size calculations, like you're looking at mortality difference in two groups and you can put three or four or five variables into like a logistic model. But, you know, there are some simple ways. There are some online resources for power calculations. Kind of like Christine was referring to, a lot of these are sort of like easy formulas. But what you don't know is the internals about how they do them. Most of them are probably okay, but you don't really know what all the assumptions are. And it's better to use that than say nothing. But it's also easy to get lost and maybe you choose the wrong option and you write your paper, your IRB, and someone who's a statistician says, wait a second, that doesn't look right. You can look around on the internet and kind of find this stuff. It's certainly a good thing to do as you start out is try to figure out some of this stuff on your own. With time, you become more savvy and start to meet a statistician, ask those kind of questions to get better at it. The last thing in, it would be when you shouldn't, I said almost always do a power calculation. When you shouldn't do it, it's what's called post hoc power. If you have a fixed sample size, you shouldn't do a power calculation because for technical reasons, it's just a recapitulation of your effect size. And it's sort of misleading. If anybody really wants to know, I can send you a paper. Just say we have a fixed number of patients because this is the number of echoes that were done in our QA database in these two years. And this is what we have. And therefore, we didn't do a power calculation. It's better to do that than say nothing or try to do a post hoc one. Transparency and explaining your underlying assumptions for me are like the overall guiding principles of most things, stats, probably all things. Yeah, that's, those are important points. And then can you just comment on when they talk about like what's your desired power when you're doing your sample size calculation? Like what are the, the if they do go on the website and try to do their own sample size calculation and ask for all this information? Yeah, yeah. Pop Power is the is the is the probability, the likelihood to find um, you're going to true association if in fact one exists. So a simple term would be my blood pressure example. If new drug A really affects blood pressure, the likelihood that my, you know the number of patients you would need to recruit in order to detect that true effect. But of course, you know, that's the simple explanation, but it, it's a little more complicated and you have to set the true effect. My new blood pressure medication is going to lower your blood pressure on average by 10 points. And the 80% power means if in fact my new drug lowers blood pressure by 10 points, I need 500 patients to detect this with 80% probability. So I have an 80% chance of being right. Okay. Awesome. No, that was really helpful. So let's just move on to another thing with RCTs, and that is randomization. Can you just provide us something simple? And we're talking about simple studies, not big industry-funded studies that are always perfect, by the way. If you see a perfect study, look at the back and see if it's funded by 
some kind of industry, but just how would you approach randomization? There's different ways, like they talk about block randomization. So if you can just for a, a simple randomized study that a novice researcher wants to do, what is your advice on that? Who wants to go first? I guess we're just going ladies first. There's like several different types of randomization, right? So uh, we have simple randomization, we have block randomization, we have stratified randomization, adaptive randomization. Those are some of the many techniques, you know, this our simple randomization, right? That's just our simple flip toss the coin one by one. Like if we come into the emergency department, we're looking for patients with pain. We just, you know, toss the coin. Are you going to be given acupuncture or not? And then we just do it that way. Every patient that comes in with pain, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. That's the simplest way one can do it. The other way we could do a block randomization, right? So block randomization, we see it in a lot of those very large trials, multi-hospital trials where, you know, it's, it may be difficult to necessarily use the simple technique, just flip a coin every time. People might not have the time or resources to do that. So, you know, you pre-plan it before. You have these blocks. If your sample size works out perfectly that way, like, you know, if it's evenly designed so that you can have eight block patients, then all your blocks are, are blocks of eight patients per day or whatnot. And then you specify within those blocks how many patients receive the treatment, how many patients receive the control. It gives your sites a little bit more flexibility so that they don't have to flip a coin every time a patient, an eligible patient's there. They just know that they have to have three of the patients have to be in control and three of the patients have to be in treatment on this given day or time. So that allows especially EDs to like when we're conducting studies for us to be a little bit more flexible because it gives us that flexibility. Then there's like stratified randomization right we're taking into consideration like when we're conducting a, a specific study if we feel like you know age or diagnosis might have a significant impact on how outcomes come we might want to use one or two of those as our stratifications and create strata with older patients and one strata younger patients and another strata and kind of like analyze them separately and then the other technique is adaptive randomization where you can kind of compare the two. In stratified randomization, you're not trying to stratify based on every single confounder you can think of. It's usually one or two big things. Adaptive random sampling, they actually adjust the study randomization depending on how the trial's going, looking at preliminary analyses of the data. If they feel like something is confounding the results, they might want to use those findings to further substratify the patients in different groups or assign them to different treatments. So those are just some of the different techniques that are used. And we can see how these modified techniques help address confounders or something because it, it, it helps us gain control of the situation and helps us give us better outcomes. Okay, good. Thank you. That was a nice explanation of all the different kinds of randomization. Rob, do you have anything to add on that? No, that was pretty thorough. I mean, this is one of those things where there are statisticians that are like just trial statisticians, and it's sort of like its own branch of statistics. You wouldn't just go up to say to a doctor and be like, oh, you're a doctor. You know everything about all aspects of medicine. St stats is a lot like that. There are people that specialized in, or specialize in trial stats or mixed models and stuff like that. If you're really getting nitty gritty upper level stuff, you should have a trial statistician. I think Christine provided a really good overview. The general idea is that you're supposed to create groups that are basically equal at baseline for like known and unknown factors. The idea being that your intervention is the only thing that's different between the groups. And so there's just different strategies to help you get there, which she very nicely described. So when you make your table on your paper and you compare your two groups, there shouldn't be a difference between the two groups if you randomize them appropriately, but sometimes there are, as we know. So Rob, I wanted to kind of move on to just something else that's really important because I think we only have about 10 minutes and then we'll open up to any questions. And this goes into just kind of our comparison of the different groups. And if you can maybe talk about the multiple comparisons versus multivariate analysis, because they sometimes that gets confused and a little bit about p-hacking. And I think we can spend the next 10 minutes focused on that because that's a big kind of topic that comes up in some issues that people might have with either reviewing or actually in their own research. But can you please comment on that? Yes. Yeah, so I laugh because I was just writing something about this, in like a response to a review. But anyways, multivariate and multivariable get kind of thrown around interchangeably and they do mean different things. Multivariable is just like more than one variable. So if you have a regression model that's got like age and height and weight, that'd be multivariable. Multivariate usually refers to repeated 
repeated measures type design, repeated measure type designs are like longitudinal or sometimes cluster data. Most people mean multivariable, not multivariate. It's sort of pedantic. Um, drone out about it, but sometimes it, it can be confusing if somebody is thinking about it in different ways. I have multiple comparison testing, like p-hacking. So generally the idea is that the more comparisons you make, the more statistical tests you do, the more likely you are to have the false positive, right? You set your false discovery rate at 5%. There's a graph that goes around all the time that if you go out to 13 comparisons, your false discovery rate is like 50%. So the idea of p-hacking is that you just do a bunch of tests over and compare a bunch of things until you find one that's statistically significant. And you say, aha, I knew it all along. But this is the thing that's really important. Obviously, that's bad. You shouldn't do it. The idea of multiple comparison adjustments is essentially takes into account that you're making multiple comparisons and tries to adjust down against the false discovery rate. There's a couple of different methods you might have seen. There's like Bonferroni correction, Tukey correction, a whole bunch of other ones. And, you know, this is like a heavily debated question in like stats literature and like clinical research. There's some people that will die on the hill of like, you always must. And there's some people that die on the hill of like, like you never should. And for me, the answer is somewhere in between. It kind of depends on the situation, right? There, there's always a trade-off between like type one error, false discovery rate, saying there really is a difference when there is no difference. The trade-off is that the type two error, you don't want to say there's a difference when there really isn't one, but then you also don't want to miss a significant finding. And so those type one and type two errors are always like kind of hanging the balance together. And as you try to get better on one, you can get worse on the other. So my general thought is if you're testing a single hypothesis, for example, if you are trying to figure out what molecule is associated with mortality and you tested 50 different molecules, like to me, that's something that should be multiple comparison adjusted because you're really asking the same question over and over again, because in that case, the false discovery rate, the false positive, that would probably be bad. Whereas if you're testing a whole bunch of different sort of maybe even related hypotheses in the same paper. Like, you know, maybe I want to know if molecule A is associated with death or molecule B is associated with length of stay and molecule C is associated with, I don't know, need for mechanical ventilation. You know, to me, those are kind of different questions. I mean, as long as there's some like theoretical basis for there being like differences between those tests, then and that that's a situation in which I don't think you would need to multiple comparison adjust. Um, and like I said, there's like, there are differing opinions out there. Some people say if your hypothesis generating, there's people that equally vehemently argue that like, if this is only hypothesis generating, then you definitely should not multiple comparison adjust because you're trying to find, you know, it's a preliminary study. You're trying to find the candidates that are maybe useful. And then you want to go out and do more testing, but people will more vehemently argue that, well, no, if you're just getting error, like signal, you're getting noise, not signal, you're going to waste money and resources. You must adjust in the hypothesis generating situation so that you don't like go on a bunch of wild goose chases. So Good yeah. Point. yeah, I don't know, but I do hear what Christine thinks. Yes, no, I completely agree. And just to add, Dr. Ehrman was saying, you see all these different corrections that are used for multiple comparisons, right? Sometimes you're genuinely not trying to like make every single comparison in the world. You're just worried whether these two um, groups are different as a secondary outcome, because that could have impacted my primary outcome. One way of adjusting for that is Dr. Ehrman was saying that it's called a Bonferroni correction, right? And just to give you a conceptual of idea of how that works, typically we use p-values in our study as p equals 0.05. You just take that p-value and you divide it by the number of variables you're trying to compare, right? So if it's like 25 variables you're trying to compare, you divide your p-value by that and that becomes your new p-value. Now your analyses have become adjusted for multiple comparisons because you've made your p-value so low to the point that you're making it more difficult to reach significance, if that makes sense. And I think just to address a little bit on that idea of p-hacking, I just get, wanted to give you guys an example that just came to mind, right? Because these are all interrelated concepts. So there's been studies published where the primary outcome was not severe effects, but a particular type of severe effect. But then they go on later to specify the different types of severe effects, and then they compare them between groups. And there was no statistical significance, right? But then they decided to make it a composite outcome of all the severe effects, and they were able to find statistical significance between groups. So the thing is, it comes down to your hypothesis, right? If your hypothesis was originally that, hey, we're going to take all of the severe effects and we're going to compare it between groups, it's going to be a composite outcome that was allowable. 
but then not choosing one specific severe effect. And because you don't find statistical significance, you decide to make all the severe effects a composite outcome. The, the idea is to be genuine and intent from the beginning. And if you realize you can't be genuine and intent because you're thinking that you have to compare because this might have affected my primary outcome, then you do your multiple comparisons adjustment by doing your bond for only correction or whatnot. That's a good point. So it seems like good research, you want to generate your hypothesis collect data, test only that effect. And then if you're, you look at your p-value, your confidence intervals, et cetera, versus bad research where you collect the data, you test many effects and you find the effects are the p's less than 0 0.05. And then you conclude that there's strong evidence that's like bad research. Is that a good summary? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to, if people are going to try to have like nefarious motives, it's hard to ferret that out. And that's why, again, I say like transparency, there's a move in a lot of statistics literature and clinical research away from this excessively binary thinking where P less than 0 0.05, you're right, like two thumbs up always. And if it's not significant, then, you know, you fail. It's way more nuanced than that. So I'd rather see a negative study or I don't like the term marginal significance, whatever, trending towards for different reasons, but report what you pre-specify your hypotheses, tell us what you found, and then tell us why you think, maybe you think that your result wasn't significant because you ran out of money and you couldn't enroll your whole sample size, or this was a pilot study. And before we go out and convince someone to give us a million dollars, we need to know that there's some signal. Like most studies, everyone wants to have the study. It's a big RCT that changes the world and everybody high fives, but most of the time scientific progress is incremental. It's okay to have not an overwhelmingly positive result. Just be circumspect, be honest, be transparent, say what you think. And then again, that's more compelling to me than it's like, well, we thought we were going to see this outcome and we didn't really get there. But actually, maybe the reason is that like the cohort, we anticipated that our patients were going to have an average SOFA score of six based on historical data. And actually they only had four. And so that might actually explain why our intervention didn't work as well, because we think our hypothesis is that it works in these sicker patients. That's to me, that's better science. And I, I could get behind that more than like, well, we just changed our outcome because it didn't work. And instead of death, we're going to look at like ICU length of stay. And that showed a big difference. That's a good point. So just, it goes back to like what you learned in preschool, <laughs> be honest and don't lie. But anyway, and also just like negative studies are actually important studies. I think people don't report them as, as often, but sometimes they're actually good information and, and important for us to know. So we just have one question because I think we're out of time. And this is from in the chat. It says, if, if you have a large effect size resulting in a small number of patients needed for an RCT, how often have you seen someone power to a secondary tertiary outcome in order to enroll more subjects in order to be able to talk about these other non-primary outcomes? I know that was loaded. You could probably see it yourself in the chat, but I thought we could... Uh, but Christine, you take this. So this is what I think, right? If you're trying... Let's go back to the very basic piece of this. If you're trying to repeat a study that's already been done, think about why you're doing it, right? Because... Like the reviewers will even come back and tell you, why are you repeating a study that's already been done? Or why are you not powering it in the first place to a secondary or tertiary outcome that the other study looked at? Because that hasn't been looked at in detail, right? Because if the study, that previous study was already well powered and to, to detect a difference, then there's like no necessity to repeat that study in the first place, or if it's all, so see what else exists out there. So just make sure that you're not trying to repeat something that's already been done and done very well. If it's not done very well, then that gives you a reason why not to use that study in your power calculation, right? Because then if the study wasn't done well in the first place. So you can say that in your method section, we did a sample size calculation. It came out to this, but we realized that the study wasn't really well done. That's why we're repeating it. So we're going to enroll a higher number of patients because we're not sure of this calculation or something of that nature. And if you are really interested in those secondary or tertiary outcomes in that other paper, because that was more of interest to you and that hasn't been further investigated, then you can definitely do that as well. But I would say just to take a step back and reevaluating that, why are you redoing the study? And if it's because the study wasn't well done, then use that sample size calculation, but say that we're enrolling more patients because we didn't feel that the study was well done. Thank you both. I think we're out of time. So just wanted to express our sincere appreciation on the behalf of the research committee for SAM. Thank you, Dr. Ehrman. Thank you, Dr. Ramden. Thank you, everybody who has attended. Thank you if you're listening.